you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Amos, chapter 3, begin reading with verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Can a bird fall in the snare from the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Publish in the palaces at Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria, and behold, the great tumults in the midst thereof, and the oppressed in the midst thereof. For they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus in a couch. Hear ye, and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, Bring, and let us drink. The Lord God hath sworn by his holiness that, lo, the day shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And ye shall go out at the breaches, every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Look again at verse 7 and 8. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear. The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy. I want to speak to you today on the subject, America, take heed to God's roar. America, take heed to God's roar. This is a message spoken by Amos to the children of Israel in the long ago, but I know of no message that so parallels America today as it paralleled Israel of long ago. And notice in the first place, Amos said, this is not a message to you, but this is a message against you. Therefore, we ought to pay heed all the more. Sometimes God doesn't speak to us. He speaks against us. And even though the Lord spoke against Israel of old, they paid no attention to the message. They told Amos, they said, you get back down south where you've been preaching. Don't preach this message up here at Bethel. We cannot contain it. We will not receive it. We will not hear it. And so I hope the day that we'll not be as Israel was in days gone by, that we'll not pay attention to the message that God has to give to us. There are many people today who believe that America is the same as she was 25 or 30 years ago. But ladies and gentlemen, she is not. There are many people 25 and 30 years ago who would have been afraid to speak out against America who now wipe their feet upon us. Who would have thought 25 years ago of a little country by the name of North Korea telling the United States that we'll keep your ship and we'll keep it as long as we want to. And yet that's what's happening today. People who were our friends 25 years ago laugh at us. They mock at us. They tell us, get out of our country. Leave us alone. We don't want to have anything to do with you. You say, well, preacher, I don't care how many friends America loses. I don't care if she loses all of them. Just so long as we've got God on our side, that's all we've got to worry about. And you know that we have God on our side. Ladies and gentlemen, if God were still on America's side today, we'd have nothing to worry about. But the thing that disturbs me is, I do not believe that we even have God left anymore. I believe that God is roaring at America. He's telling America, either you'll pay attention to what I'm saying now, or I will destroy you from off the face of the earth. There are many parallels between America of today and Israel of old. I know that we're not the chosen nation in the same sense that Israel was, but there are many parallels. Notice what God said. He said, I'm writing to a bunch of people that I brought up from the land of Egypt. The children of Israel were brought out of the fiery furnace of Egypt when the people of Egypt tried to oppress them, tried to enslave them, 
tried to kill them. God led them out of that bondage into the promised land of Egypt where they could enjoy the freedom of Canaan. There was a day gone by some 400 years ago when the people of our forefathers cried out to God in the furnace of Europe and said, Oh God, would you give us a place where we can worship you? Would you give us a place where we can honor you, where the enemy will not try to devour us? And God opened up the land of America and our forefathers came to these shores as a place to worship and honor and serve God according to the dictates of their own heart. Notice another thing. God said to Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. That is a technical term, meaning that Israel was like a wife to God. God said, You've been like a wife to me. You've been so close in your relationship. But He said, I'm now about to divorce you. You've been like a wife to me. You notice that when God planted Israel in the days gone by, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8 says, He set the bounds of the nations according to His little country of Israel. When Edom came to try to invade Israel, God said, You can't have her. She belongs to me. When Moab came to take away Israel, God said, You can't have her. Israel belongs to me. When the Philistines came after Israel, God said, You can't have her. She belongs to me. During the last three or four hundred years, there have been many nations who have risen up against America and said, We will devour her. England said we'll take her. France said we'll have her. Germany said she belongs to me. Japan says I'll run her down. But ladies and gentlemen, every nation that has come against America, God has slapped their hands away and God said you can't have her. I will not permit you to touch her. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe the next nation that rises up against America, God will let that nation overrun America. He will let that nation destroy America unless we pay attention to God's roar. God said, Israel, I'm going to punish you because I've known you and you've known me. And the people that know God the most are the people that God expects the most out of. And he said, Israel, you and I have walked together, but we're not going to be walking that way anymore. Can two walk together except they be agreed? What was Amos saying? He said, can two of us walk together if one's trying to go to the left and the other's trying to go to the right? Or one's trying to go toward the north and the other's trying to go toward the south? God said to Israel through Amos, we used to walk side by side, going to the same places, doing the same things, but not anymore. And that's the same thing that can be said about America. We used to walk side by side with God. When God said something, we did it. In the early days of our country, our leaders planted their laws on the basis of the Word of God. Our leaders established schools. They honored God's day. They worked for God. They labored for God. They served God. But that day has gone by. Ladies and gentlemen, God's still walking the same way He's always walked. God's always honored His Word. God's always honored His day. God's always honored His precepts. You'll never get God to change His direction. For example, for 6,000 years, one day out of every seven, God's been meeting with His people, worshiping morning and night, and giving instructions for the way to go. And God has not missed it one day at all. He's always been there. He's has had a 6,000 year perfect attendance record on Sunday of being there with God's people. God still goes to church regularly. God still honors His Word. God still honors His law. But Americans by the scores have turned away from God. They don't care what God says about divorce. They just go ahead and divorce. They don't care what God says about nakedness. They go ahead and run, run naked in the streets of America. And they say, we don't care. That's why Amos said to Israel, said, you're going one way and God's going another way. God is still as old-fashioned as he was when my daddy was alive. He's still as old-fashioned as he was when my grandfather's alive. And he has not changed. He's walking one way, but he said, we can't walk together if we're not agreed. What about it again? Amos said, Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Amos said, Isn't there a cause for what I'm saying? Amos said, I won't ask you a question about a lion. Is it the nature of a lion to run through the forest at all times howling at the top of his voice? No. The only time a lion starts roaring is just about the time when he's going to jump on an antelope or a deer, or a lamb, and tear it to pieces. He roars just before he strikes and kills the enemy. Amos said the same thing about God. He said, does God blow his horn all the time? 
Or does God blow the horn when there's danger and the enemy is near? Notice again about the birds. He said, Can a bird fall in a snare from the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? He said, Is it the nature of a bird to go around fluttering and making a lot of noise all the time? No. When you set a trap for a bird, if you've ever set a trap and put your grains of corn out there 15 or 20 feet from the trap, while the, while the bird's out there eating the grains of corn, he's as quiet and still as a mouse. But when he gets there and bites that last grain and the trap falls, then's when he begins to holler and to flutter and make all kinds of commotion. Why? Because danger is near. And Amos said, what about a trumpeteer in the city? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? He said, is it the nature of a man to stand on the wall of a city and blow the trumpet at all time? No, a trumpeteer or a siren blower stands there to blow when danger from the enemy draws nigh. Have you ever followed an ambulance through the streets of a city and the horn was not on? I have a number of times. The ambulance drove normally, but when the sound of the siren began to blow, everybody got out of the way because they recognized danger was very near and it was time to get moving because there was destruction or death or tragedy nearby. Amos said, doesn't God have as much sense as an ambulance driver? God doesn't blow his horn all the time. He just blows his horn when danger's near. And Amos said, if God still fought Israel, why is it that he's blowing his trumpet so loud? Why is he warning Israel? And I would ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if God's for America today, why is he blowing his trumpet so loud? Who's God's horn blower? Well, God says in verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Ladies and gentlemen, God has never destroyed any nation until he first told his preachers about it. It's God's plan to tell his preachers about the destruction of any nation. Amos said, I want you to know the lion hath roared, who will not fear the Lord God hath spoken, who can prophesy. Amos said, I'm one of God's prophets, and God has already roared, and it's my duty to tell you about it. Now, I want you to say, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord God is blowing his horn at America today, and it's the duty of God's preachers to tell you about it. Have you ever heard so many preachers in all your life calling America, repent or else, America, repent or else, America, get right or else? Where do we get that message? It wasn't something we had stuck. It came from the Lord God himself. Preachers all over America are harboring judgment today because judgment is about to fall unless we take heed to the roar of God. Amos illustrated what he meant about the blowing of the trumpet and about God roaring. Amos said, I want to ask you some questions to prove to you that God is already blowing his trumpet. In chapters 4, verse 6, he said, How come you got such white teeth? Listen to it. I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and water bread in all your places, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Amos said, you think God's for Israel? Then he said, how come so many of you got white teeth? It wasn't from using our pan of toothpaste, our pepsi did. It was because you didn't have anything to eat. He said, God promised you he'd feed you, but said there's famine in the land. Why has God taken your bread away if God's still for you? Amos said, let me ask you again. I also have withholding the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Amos said when God planted you, he promised to water your land. But he said in part of your land you've got too much water and in some parts of your land you don't have any water. He said, why has God done that to you? He said, in order to get your attention and to get you right with God. But he said, you paid no attention to the trumpet. You didn't take heed. You take no warning. You wouldn't act. And God said, he's still, Amos said, he's still got his horn on. Listen again. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. 
Amos said, how come your crops been eat up? How come the bugs are on all of your beans and potatoes and vegetables and destroying them? He said, God promised to feed you, but he's letting the bugs eat up the crop. How come that is, if God's for you? Listen again. I've sent among you the pestilence after the man of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword and have taken away your horses. And I've made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God said, I'll let some of your boys die in war. I've let some of them die in tragic deaths. And yet you've not returned unto me. Why is it that you will not? He said, God's got his horn on all wide open. And you still won't return to God. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God said, I had to send lightning from heaven and burn up some of your cities, and yet ye would not return to me. Amos said, it sounds to me like God's got his horn blowing at Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last few years, God has turned his siren on against America. The horn's wide open if you've got any ears to hear. For instance, in 1964, when Americans all over this nation were getting ready to celebrate Easter on what's known as Good Friday, there came an earthquake that struck the biggest state in the United States. It struck the city of Alaska with such force that it caused more damage, a hundred times more damage than the whole state of Alaska caused us. There were folks dead by the scores and houses damaged by the millions of dollars worth of damage and yet who paid attention to it? Who tried to get back to God because of the earthquake in Alaska? A few years later, they hit a tornado. The R.A. Hurricane swept across the southern part of the United States and swept it with such force that anyone who has any discernment at all could feel the hand of God sweeping across the land, yet who paid any attention to it? Two years ago in the city of Chicago, God let the snowflakes fall and it fell with such rapidity and such speed that it tied up the second biggest city in the country. Yet who paid any attention to it? We paid $5 a gallon for milk, a dollar loaf for bread, and folks dead as a result of the snow. Yet who paid any attention and started crying out and saying, Oh God, what's wrong with America? Let us get back right with you. Just last year in this beloved country of ours, a flood water came across the state of Texas, covered an area as big as the entire state of Kentucky. Billions of dollars worth of damage done in the state of Texas. Yet who paid any attention? Yet who fell before God and said, let's get right with God. Let's turn back to God. God's roaring at us. God's trying to gain our attention. Who does not remember last year in the northwest part of our country? Firemen on top of firemen out stopping, trying to stop forest fires. What were they caused by? Not by cigarette butts. But the lightning, the lightning would strike one forest, then it would strike another forest, and then it would strike another forest. Why was God burning up our country if God's still for us? Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, every year in America, an average of 365 people get killed with lightning from heaven? Why is that so if God's still for us? Why, just last October, in the state of California, was a lightning bolt struck a city and struck a, a deadly cloning plant and sent the fumes all over that city. Why is that so if God's still for us? Why, a few weeks ago in Texas, did lightning strike an airplane and kill 80 people if God's still for us? It sounds to me just like God's roaring across America, saying, America, you better listen, you better wake up while there's time. Ladies and gentlemen, have you heard his voice? The southern part of the United States experienced a drought in the cotton belt, the likes of which they've not known in 60 years in the southern part of the United States. Why is this if God's for us? And then who's not aware of the fact that our boys are dying in Vietnam and our boys have died year after year? Yet who's fell on his face before God and said, Oh God, help us to come back to you. Help us to listen to your roar. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do not listen to God's roar, there's something else. The roar is not all, but Amos said, I want to tell you, God's blowing his trumpet, and the reason any trumpet here blows a trumpet is order, in order that you may alert yourself and get right with God. I hope if you've got ears to hear and at all any heart to respond today, you'll sit up and take notice to the roar of God, because, ladies and gentlemen, when God stops roaring, then this country's had it. Oh, if God ever stops his wind and his lightning and it floods across this land, then what Amos said in verse 12 will be reality. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. That's not an evangelistic text except secondarily. That's judgment. He said, because I've roared and you've paid no attention, 
then get ready to meet God for you shall meet him. May God help us today to pay attention while it'll do some good to pay attention to him.